to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. We're so glad that you joined us for our study of acceptable worship in the church today as it relates to Christianity start to finish. Again, we're glad that you've joined us for this broadcast. We hope that as we study today that you'll have your Bible handy. If you don't have your Bible out and open, we want you to stop what you're doing, locate your Bible. If you've got that on a smartphone, get that app opened up as we're going to look to the Word of God today as it relates to all matters in religion. And friend, we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. We want you to know that today's broadcast is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ, the Lord's Church in your area. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You will find people there who love God, who are concerned about thus saith the Lord, who, who, who would be happy to sit down across the table from you and talk about any matters, whether that be salvation, whether that be things like we're thinking about today, worship, whether that be moral issues, whatever it be, they'd be happy to sit down, open up the Word of God, and just let God's voice speak on that matter. And so please visit the Lord's Church in your local area. You won't be disappointed that you did. Friend, we'd also love to help you here at the Gospel of Christ. Uh, we have a wide variety of good Bible study material that is all available to you free of charge. Go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have audio lessons, video lessons, study questions, transcripts, written material, just a wide variety of good Bible study material. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of any of our lessons, on any book of the Old Testament, any book of the New, a wide variety of topical studies. Just go to the website, fill out a free media request form. Uh, we can send that to you instantly as a digital download, or if you'd like to have a DVD or CD, you can check that out as well. We have a Roku, Roku channel, other channels as well available on a lot of the streaming media, and check out our app. The Gospel of Christ app is available both for Android and Apple. It's available in the respective Play Stores. It's a great way to study the Word of God in our fast-paced world as we live today. And so we encourage you to check out those ways of growing and helping in your study of God's Word. Today we're thinking about in our study of Christianity start to finish. The worship, the organization, the worship, and the nature of the church Jesus built. Now, just by way of reminder, real quickly, we have noticed that in matters of religion, God and Jesus have all authority. All authority, Jesus said, has been given to me. That authority for us is found in the Bible. We must not go beyond what is written. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, 2 John verse 9. As it relates to the church, we noticed in our last lesson that Jesus built it, I will build my church, it belongs to him, it is his church, and it's singular in nature. That division and denominationalism is contrary to the plan that we find in the Bible, and that the Lord's church is organized with elders overseeing every local congregation and deacons who work under those elders. Now let's think about the worship of Christ's church. How does the church worship according to the Bible? In John 4, verse 24, I want you to notice again these words. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. 
acceptable worship. What is it? Well, friend, it's done in spirit and in truth. Our spirit is our whole person, our whole being. All our energy and zeal and desire and love and motivation would be wrapped up in that idea. And when I worship, I don't want to be just sitting there like a proverbial lump on a log going through the motions. I need to be involved and excited in that. But it also has to be guided by truth. How do you worship God in truth? Well, we might begin again by thinking about what is truth. John 17, verse 17. Jesus prayed to the Father, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Friend, acceptable worship to God today is based on the truth of God's word. It's not based upon what men think is popular. It's not based on emotion. It's not based on things you don't find in the Bible. Acceptable worship that pleases and honors God is the way God asks for it. L listen carefully to me now. Oftentimes, when we think about worship, we have it exactly backwards. We think worship ought to be about, ought to make me feel good. Worship ought to be about what I want. Worship ought to excite and enthuse and get the juices flowing, as it were. Our friend, while biblical worship ought to do those things because it's based on the Bible, Worship, man, is not the object of worship. God is. Those who worship God. We didn't gather to worship or to uh, praise or to make ourselves feel good. We've gathered to honor God, to do what he's asked us to do in worship that pleases and honors him. And friend, to do that, it's got to be based on what we find in the Bible. In fact, when people didn't do that, their worship was worthless in God's perspective. Listen to Matthew 15, verse number nine. Jesus said, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. What does vain mean? Worthless, useless, of no value. What kind of worship is worthless? Worship that is based on man's commandments and man's ideas and not what you find in the Bible. And so are we today to worship God according to the commandments of uninspired men? Of course not. God's not going to accept that. We've got to worship God the way he's asked us to in the Bible. Well, if that's the case, how did people in the New Testament church, how did Christians in the first century, worship God. One of the ways they honored God in their worship as, as a congregation, as a body of believers, was by taking of the Lord's Supper. Look in your Bible in Luke chapter 22. In the New Testament, the church and Christians are commanded by God to worship by partaking of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Luke 22. I want you to notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse number 19 and 20. The Bible says, And Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Listen to those statements. This is my body. This is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we have the, the command to partake of the Lord's Supper as Jesus taught us in the Bible. Now, here's what those elements represent. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16, the Bible says that cup is a communion of the blood of Christ. That bread is a communion of the body of Christ. We are having fellowship, closeness, communion with God and his son Jesus Christ in our worship when we partake of that cup and when we partake of that bread. And so what a great fellowship we have there. But how often did Christians do that in the New Testament? Would you open your Bible with me to Acts chapter 20? 
verse number seven. I want you to see something from the New Testament about worship that God has commanded. Acts chapter 20. We're going to follow the example of the Bible. How often did New Testament Christians do that? The Bible says, now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. On the first day of the week, listen to this, when the disciples came together to break bread. Their purpose for coming together was to break bread, representative of remembering the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection through the Lord's Supper, and they came together on the first day of the week. Now, that phraseology, first day of the week, what does that mean? Well, let's use an Old Testament illustration, maybe to help understand that better. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, God told the Israelites, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. First day of the week, Sabbath. God said, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. How did God expect the Israelites to remember the Sabbath? Every Saturday, every seventh day that rolled around, they were to remember that. They knew that's what the language meant. When those Christians met on the first day of the week for the Lord's Supper, did they do it every first day of the week? Well, sure they did. Every week has a first day. There's no specific week being talked about here. Christians today, as we remember the Lord's Supper, as we follow the divine example, we should take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Every week has a first day, and thus every first day of the week. Let me help with that. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, as I've given orders to the churches in Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of every week. Let each one of you lay by in store as he has prospered that be no collections when I come. Now, they were coming every first day of the week. Acts 20 verse 7. They came for the purpose of partaking the Lord's Supper. And so if it was every first day of the week and the purpose was to partake the Lord's Supper, then friend, we ought to do that every first day of the week. Acts 2 verse 42, the Bible says of those early Christians, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. What they saw the apostles do, that's what they continued in. Friend, what we see through the word of God, the apostles doing, take a Lord's Supper first day of the week. That's what Christians ought to do today as well. Well, what else are Christians commanded to do as part of their worship? Friend, we're also commanded to give as we've been prospered. We mentioned it earlier, but I want you to look in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week. First day of every week, most versions will say, let each one of you lay something aside, storing it up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. As we think about our worship, and friend, please understand what we're saying here. We're talking about Christians in their local congregation worshiping God in the first day of the week assembly. Is it God's will then that we give as we've been prospered? What absolutely is. Are we to make a contribution on the same day we partake of Lord's Supper? Now, friend, I think this will help you to see that we really can understand the language first day of the week. Let me illustrate. How many places, if you were to go this Sunday, would not take up a contribution? Anywhere you go is going to take up a contribution on the first day of the week. Why do we understand that language? when it relates to the contribution, and everybody understands it. But we don't when it relates to the Lord's Supper. First day of the week, there's a giving. Acts 20, verse 7, first day of the week, there's the Lord's Supper. We can understand it here, but we can't here. Again, there's an inconsistency in that. And then as it relates to our worship, the Bible teaches that we are to praise God in song. Look in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 19. Not only do we take the Lord's Supper, 
Not only do we give, but the Bible teaches we are to worship God in singing. Ephesians 5, verse number 19. The Bible says we are speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Are Christians in their worship to sing? Absolutely. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, verse 16. Hebrews 2, Romans 15, there's a host of passage where we see Matthew 26, Jesus and his disciples sang a hymn. The idea of singing is clearly seen in the New Testament. Now, does this passage or any others in the New Testament mention mechanical instruments of music? Friend, you read from Matthew through Revelation as it relates to the worship of the church here on earth. There's no mention anywhere, no command anywhere of mechanical instruments of music. In fact, uh, a fact that you can even look up yourself is that church history tells us that the followers of Christ did not use instrumental mechanical instruments of music in the worship for hundreds of years after Christ died and after the church was established. In fact, there's some today who still don't use that. Greek Orthodox who broke away from the Roman Catholic still doesn't use mechanical instruments of music. Now, one of the things that's unique about the worship in the Lord's church is we don't use mechanical instruments of music in worship. And, and, and here's why. Maybe this will illustrate. I want you to think about what God specifically asked for, and let's learn a lesson from that. Genesis chapter 6. Notice this verse. Genesis 6, verse 14. God said to Noah, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. God not only specified the type, he specified the kind, wood and gopher. Okay, so would Noah have sinned if he built the ark out of a different type? If he built it out of metal or mud, would Noah have violated the command of God? Yes, God specified the type, wood. Well, would Noah had done wrong if he built the ark out of wood, but he built it out of a different type of wood? Well, yes, Noah definitely would not have been following God's command. And so you can think of maybe three types. You got med, mud, metal, mud, and wood. What did God select as the type? Wood. And what kind? You got gopher, oak, and ash. What did God tell uh, Moses to build, Noah to build that out of? Well, he told him specifically told Noah specifically to build that out of gopher wood. Now, friend, let's think about that, that pattern as it relates to music today. God has asked for music. That's what God wants. That's the worship that he's asked for. What kind has he asked for? When God said gopher wood, that automatically eliminated any other kind of wood. Friend, when God said sing, and God said, make melody in your heart, and there is no mention anywhere in the New Testament of any other kind of music, that limit, we, we don't do it because God didn't say, we, we can't go along with that. We can't say to ourselves, well, God didn't say not to. God didn't specifically say to, to Noah, don't build it out of oak and ash, but when God did say build it out of gopher, that eliminated everything else. When God said sing and make melody in your heart, God doesn't have to go back and say, by the way, I don't want you to beat on a banjo and I don't want you to pick on a piano and I don't want you to strum on a guitar. When God said sing and make melody in your heart, and there's no mention anywhere else of anything else in the New Testament for worship today, well, friend, that eliminates that idea. Now, here's an illustration that I think will help with that. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. I want you to take your Bible and look there. I want you to see that throughout the Scripture, we learn that God wants us to do exactly what He tells us. Look in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire on it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he'd not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. These two young priests, Nadab and Abihu, did they sin 
when they offered a strange, some versions say unauthorized fire before uh, that God had not commanded them. Yeah. When they did something God had not asked for, God was not at all pleased. Did God punish Nadab and Abihu for doing something he'd not asked for? Absolutely. And thus, it's important to remember when we worship God, it's not about me. Worship is not about me. And it's not about, I'm not the object, I'm not the center of worship, nor are you. Worship is about worshiping God the way he's asked us to, without alteration. Think about it like this. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. We are to partake of the unleavened bread as a memorial of the Lord's body. We are to partake of the fruit of the vine as a memorial and communion of his blood. Now, would it be would it be wrong? Would it be wrong if we put, if we, instead of having that old dry unleavened bread, if we had toast with strawberry jelly on it? Would that be okay? Instead of having through the vine, what if we had an energy drink? A lot of people might stay awake better. What if we had a Red Bull energy drink instead of through the vine on the Lord's Supper? Would that be okay? What if we had hamburgers and milkshakes at the Lord's Supper? Would that be okay? Well, of course not. We're told in the Bible not to go beyond what's written. Noah couldn't make it out of oak and ash, couldn't make the ark out of oak and ash. God didn't approve of Nadab and Abihu offering a strange or unauthorized fire that he not commanded. And friend, if it's wrong to put milkshakes and hamburgers on the Lord's Supper, then we've got to realize when God tells us to sing and make melody in our heart, to worship only the way he's told us to, that's how we're going to be pleasing to Almighty God. And so as we think about the church that Jesus built, we think about its name. Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're talking today not about a man-made denomination. We're not talking about uh, some religion following men in the Reformation or Restoration period. We're talking about being a part of the same church that Paul and Peter and people in the first century were a part of, the church Jesus died for. And friend, that's special. Acts 20, verse 28, Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. Who paid the price? Who purchased the church? Well, Jesus did. With what price did he purchase the church? His own blood. If it's his blood that ran, that freely flowed down from Calvary, that purchased and bought the church, my friend, how dare anyone who did not pay that price, nor could they, put their name on the Lord's church today. It's special because it belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me illustrate that in the Bible, God clearly taught that men should not name religions and name groups after themselves or after other religious actions. Look in your Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want you to see the idea of division and denominating is not according to God's will. Look in 1 Corinthians 1, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verses 10 through 13. Paul says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are divisions among you. Well, what's the problem? Now, I say this. Each of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Paulus, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Friend, friend think about this for just a moment. Does the Bible here teach it was a sin to name the, the God's church, Jesus' church, the church of the New Testament. Would it be wrong to name it after Paul or Paulus or Cephas or any other human being? Paul says, absolutely. Well, each of you says, I'm Paul, I'm of Cephas, uh, I'm of Apollos. And then he says, let there be no divisions among you. Friend, if it would have been wrong to name it after Paul, if the church were named after Paul, 
Who would that be glorifying? Well, the Apostle Paul. If it were named after some religious act, like repentance, what would that be glorifying? It would be glorifying the act of repentance. Friend, if it's wrong to name it the Pauline Church, and it would be wrong to name it the Repentance Church, would it not be wrong to name the church today after men, no matter what good they may have done in the Reformation or Restoration period, or wouldn't it be not wrong to name it after some action like baptism? We've got to realize that naming the Lord's church after men or after religious acts, that's just not commanded in the Bible. Here's what is commanded. Jesus said, or Paul said, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Anything we do by our words or by our actions must be based on the authority of Christ. Now, all that being said, what name do we find in the Bible? Let me show you the two that are authorized that we definitely find in the Bible. Look in Romans 16, verse 16. Notice this passage. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth. What names do we find? Church of Christ, church of the Lord. Church of God. Those names, who do they honor? Well, they honor the Lord, they honor Jesus, and they honor God, not men. If I want to be a part of the church that, that Peter and Paul and that Jesus established and that worships according to the Bible, friend, we've got to go back to the Bible for our worship and for the church that Jesus established. And so we're glad you joined us for our broadcast today. If you've never obeyed the gospel, we'd love to talk to you about that. If you are a New Testament Christian, then friend, keep living the Christian life. Stay faithful. In our next lesson, we're going to talk about God's plan of salvation from sin to salvation. We hope you'll join us next time. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.